We've been uh, working on a series of messages, the book, how we got it and how to get the most out of it, for this will be the 12th week. About the first five, we studied the nature of the scriptures, how we got the scriptures, the collection of books that we have, the nature of inspiration. And then since then, we've been looking at the last part of that title, so how we got the book and how to get the most out of it. That's what we're talking about uh, in these recent weeks. Now, we've been away from it for, what, two Sunday nights? Two Sunday nights, yeah, because we had the Easter musical and then World Impact Sunday. The text we're kind of unpacking is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And we spent quite a bit of time looking at correction, for teaching rather, and then now reproof. We'll do that for two weeks. Next Sunday night we'll get into correction. So these steps and the order in which they come... About three weeks ago, we launched into a study on biblical reproof. Reproof is is the painful rebuke, that scolding for sin. Uh, it, it, It follows teaching because you have to know the standard, what the word says. The Holy Spirit uses that and speaks reproof into our lives. And that has to be heeded properly for the next step, correction. It's the hurt that heals, reproof. And the reason we're taking two weeks on reproof is, um, well, we don't like it. We don't like reproof. And our religious culture has infected all of us with the idea that because God is love and gracious, it just follows logically that his dealings with us should always feel positive, not negative. Positive and negative are words that should only be used to describe electrical current. Reproof doesn't feel up. Reproof doesn't feel positive, and therefore uh, it can't be It can't be good for us. We shouldn't have to put up with it. It might smother our self-image. And so this is another one of those times where you come and you let the words of the biblical text create proper thought categories because our minds won't go in the right direction without the words of Scripture. If God's word is true, reproof is good. Overwhelmingly good. And the biblical evidence here is just so lavish. I didn't want to just rush over it in our last study. I was surprised as I just started to accumulate and pile up the things God says he will do as a result of our hearing reproof with meekness and teachability and submissiveness. What God will do for people who embrace his reproof. That's what I want to go over quickly now in the next four or five steps. One, heeding reproof stops the progress and damage of sinful actions in our lives. You all know the story, 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 7, Nathan, the prophet, comes to David and exposes David's sin. And it says, verse 1, The Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had very many fields and herds. The poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. And it used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man. And he, the rich man, was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took 
the poor man's lamb, he only had one, remember, prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. He doesn't know Nathan's just making this all up. It's just a story. Nathan said to David, verse 7, well, it's you. I'm talking about you. Your sin with Bathsheba, that other man's wife. You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. It's a fascinating story. Nathan has to expose David's sin with Bathsheba. That's his job as the prophet. David's king. Risky business. In order for David, the man after God's own heart, in order for David to see the wickedness of his own sin, Nathan has to put David's sin, at least temporarily, into another person's life, this fictitious character in his story. And when David sees his own sin in the life of someone else, he's enraged by it. Life lesson there. Sin always looks worse in other people than in us. proving we're all somewhat blind to the same sins we hate in others when they pop up in ourselves. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye when there's a beam in your own eye? Who said that? Eddie Shack? Who was that? The whole point of Nathan's story is even King David has to, even King David, the man after God's own heart, he has to be made ready for reproof. We're not naturally drawn to it. Not any of us. And so God sets up Nathan's assignment because God wants David to learn to respond with the same sensitivity to his own sin as he would to the sins of others. It's quite a job. And God wants to use Nathan's parable to do this for David because, because God knows nothing good is going to happen in David's life until he learns to embrace reproof for his own sin. We've all heard the saying, there's no use crying over spilled milk. And there's a lot of truth in that little saying. Once something's done, it's done. There's no point wringing your hands over something you can't do anything about. Just move on. So, so why does God go to all the trouble of getting Nathan to confront David with his sin? It's already done. Why bother digging up, rooting up the past, grubbing around in the past? Is God just out to rub David's nose in his sin? Is God just out to make us all feel lousy about all the things we've done? Is he a killjoy? No. He's not, understand, he's not trying to take joy out of David's life. He's trying to put joy back into David's life. God has nothing but a positive plan and future for King David. Don't miss the point of those last words in, in 2 Samuel 12, 7. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. Don't miss the point of those words. This is not just God's way of reminding David who's boss. That's very true. But there's more than that here. This is, this is God speaking by the prophet as he brings David to a point of reproof for his own wickedness, saying, you're not king by accident, David. I, I, I brought you here. I delivered you from Saul. 
I anointed you as king. I have a purpose for you being here. And it's never going to be fulfilled until you learn to heed my reproof. Everything's going to come to a screeching halt. I wonder how many times that's true of me, true of you, where God has things he wants to unfold, but somehow because we've got it in our heads that, well, there's something there and he wants to bring us with meekness to a point of mourning over sin and we, we resist it because, well, life is short and we want to feel good not realizing all the while that God uses reproof to fulfill his purpose in our lives. God uses the painful process of reproof to restore joy into our lives. To make them start to bloom and sing, but on his terms. That's the goal of realized reproof in my heart and yours. Okay, point number two. You want a great verse of scripture to underline in your Bible, write it out 500 times so you never forget it. Reproof opens up our lives to the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 1, 23. Do you have it in your notes? Read it out loud with me. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Wow. one of the greatest promises in all of recorded scripture. I don't know of any other verse. I don't know of any other verse that so plainly spotlights the sheer blessing of heeding God's reproof. Two things grow out of that wonderful verse. Ignoring reproof at any one point. It doesn't have to be a lifestyle of ignoring reproof. Ignoring what you know to be the Spirit of God bringing reproof into your life for something not done or something done incorrectly or something ignored. Ignoring reproof at one point shuts the door of the gracious influences of the Holy Spirit all points. Please don't miss what I'm saying. You might, you might mistake for what I just said to, to be that you have to be absolutely perfect. And that's not what I said. Not one of us is perfect. We fail in most points by degrees. But I'm talking about the intent of your heart, okay? That's what I'm talking about. Where, where the Holy Spirit speaks and there's an intentional, an intentional bypassing of how God wants to bring reproof into your life. So it's not just that you're not perfect, it's that your heart is stubborn at one point. What happens then is the gracious influence of the Holy Spirit on all fronts starts to dry up. Because God will not allow, he wants my whole heart. God will not allow me to keep a part of it on my own terms. You heard it tonight. You cannot serve two masters. Do I submit perfectly in any area of my life? No. But I have to embrace reproof and correction in every area of my life. That's what I'm talking about here. I said there were two points there. The other one is, get this. Heeding, finally heeding reproof in one small cherished area of sin opens the door for a deeper work of the Holy Spirit in every other area of my life as well. In other words, in both directions, it's exponential. Being stubbornly self-willed in one area starts to shut down everything. Yielding graciously at a cherished sin opens the door wider for the Spirit's work in every area of my life. There's so much riding on this.
while he doesn't take time to mention reproof by word specifically, Jesus shows the need for it in the parable of the soils. You remember, some seed, says Jesus, lands on wayside soil, pathway soil. In Mark, he says the birds come and snatch it up. And because it's on that hard, packed down soil, it just never germinates. It could, though. What, what, would make, what would make seed germinate on hard, packed down soil? Well, what would do it would be something has to come and carve up that soil, plow it up, break it up. If you want roses, you have to plant them. If you want weeds, you don't have to do anything. Turn at my reproof. Surely, King James, surely I will pour out my spirit on you. So, so here's the take home. God only plants his spirit in sensitive hearts. Stubbornness quenches the spirit. Don't mistake the pain of God's reproof. Don't mistake the pain of God's reproof for the absence of the Spirit. That's not the case. It's the work of the Spirit. Embrace it. Embrace it. Point number three. Heeding reproof germinates the life-giving power of the Word after it's been studied. The text here is James 1.21 Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. So the text is talking to the church and it's talking about sin. Right? Filthiness, wickedness. That's, that's not rocket science. It's talking about sin. Put it away. Rampant wickedness is a very peculiar and specific way of talking about it. Rampant wickedness is the kind of wickedness that is culturally acceptable. That's what makes it rampant. Everyone does it. And because it's rampant, because it's culturally acceptable and encouraged, it's very easy for Christian people in the body of Christ to think, well, like, are we the only ones that really think this is wrong? Like, are we just intolerant prudes? Like, what, what is with us? And so wickedness grows and it starts to flourish. Now, he's going to talk about, so here we are. We come... We live in this culture, we come to church, we read our Bibles, we go to Bible studies, we sit in Christian ed classes, and there's God's word, okay? What's going to make that word do something in my life? You don't want to waste your time here. What's going to make God's word do something in your life? Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, that's the sin, receive with meekness. Now, why meekness? Well, because... If there's rampant wickedness, widely accepted, widely justified, applauded by the culture, and I hear God's word, and God's word speaks against it and starts to expose something in my own heart where I've grown quite careless about this rampant wickedness, it's very hard for me to stop and say, everyone is wrong. The word is true. And I know it'll bring some measure of persecution and rejection, but I want to let the word expose the sin in my life. Receive it with meekness. Receive it with meekness. As I read God's word, it will expose the things that need cleansing. It will expose the things that need replacing. And James says, the only proper way of digesting scriptural truth so you're not wasting your time with your Bible is it has to be heard with meekness, with humility. Wickedness isn't the problem. That might surprise you. Wickedness isn't the problem when I read God's word. God has made provision for all my sin. It's a glorious thing about the gospel. There is no sin that's just so big that God goes, Woof, Don, yikes, sorry. Can't help you. 
join another religion. There are no sins like that. Wickedness isn't the problem. Wickedness defended is the problem. Anybody get that? Wickedness defended is the problem. Defended against the light of God's revelation. Defended against the voice of the Spirit. Defended against the teaching of the Word. Defended against reproof. Four. Heeding reproof restores fellowship and communion with our Lord. Revelation chapter 3, 19 and 20. Those whom I love, I reprove. Don't you love it? Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Now, these next words you've heard since you were a kid, but you probably never heard them in their context. So here is the words of Christ speaking to people he loves in the church, Christian people, whom he brings reproof to and discipline and calls to repentance, okay? Then, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, as a kid, we sat at the kitchen table, six of us, sat at the kitchen table in a kitchen that's smaller than any kitchens anybody has to. You ever notice how... Families of 15 used to live in 1,100 square feet, and now families of two need like 8,000 square feet. Like, what has gone wrong? We used to sit around that kitchen table, and there were two plaques hung the way they used to hang them, about four inches from the ceiling. You want them nice and high. <laughs> Over here uh, was the unseen guest. Remember the little poem, prayer thing about the unseen guest? And over here was uh, an old picture of Jesus who, who, who looked surprisingly white. <laughs> and he had a gold, it was always like a glow around his head. And there was a door there. And Jesus was pounding on the door. And whenever I heard that talked about, it was always, and I, I don't, I'm not saying it's untrue and it doesn't bother me, and I'm sure it works this way. Sinners, Jesus comes and let him in, let him in, let him in, and, and he will. He's very gracious. That's fine. It's simply not what that verse is about. Never has been what that verse is about. It's Jesus, but it's, it's, he's knocking at the door of Cedarview. Hello, can I come in? Could I come in, please? He wants to bring reproof, correction, speaks to us about our sin. And the idea is, if you'll just listen to me, don't justify it, don't cover it up, don't deny it, just lay it all at the cross, weep for your sin. And I'll come in and we'll have dinner together. There's a, there's a, when you ignore reproof, there is a kind of peace that comes, but it's, it's a deadly peace. It's, it's really not peace, it's more numbness that starts to settle on your heart. And you wonder where God went. And you may not trace it back, and you might not even be able to trace it back after a while, but there was some point where the Holy Spirit spoke and someone didn't listen. Where do you want God to come into your life right now? Where is his healing presence needed? And when you've answered those questions, remember, remember, heeding reproof is what turns the handle. Five, and we'll be done. Heeding reproof paves the way for God's correction in our lives. The opening text, 
2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That the man or woman of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. I read that man or woman because in the Greek the word can be applied to men and women. It's a generic and that's why. Profitable for teaching, we looked at. Reproof, we're looking at. Correction is what comes next. We'll look at that building block of correction in our next study. Correction is, is the flip side of reproof. Reproof deals with exposing the problem. Correction deals with setting the bone, replacing it, fixing it. But, but, but you can't rush on to correction. You can't fix things properly until there's been a proper response to reproof. There's something that needs to be dealt with, cut out, eliminated properly before, before there can be healing and restoration and correction. I'm convinced that many people find the Christian life not working for them because they've tried to adopt and just set new things. They hear some, they read a book. They go to a conference. They hear a message. Oh, this is what will bring new life. Oh, this is how God wants to work in my heart. Oh, this is what will bring the Bible to life for me. Oh, this is how God wants to guide. And they, there they go. This, surely this will work. I've tried a whole bunch of other things. And, and, and you can't just bring something new into your life if the Spirit is talking with an edge of reproof about something old. I believe it's what Jesus was getting at when he said, blessed are those who mourn. He's not just talking about people going around with a long face. For they shall be comforted. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a response to the work of reproof where the light shines on something in my heart that needs to be dealt with. And, and if I don't properly mourn, there's a blessed kind of mourning, Jesus says. Mourning, not M-O-R-N. M-O-U-R, mourning. There's a blessedness in it. There's a comfort that follows. It follows the mourning. The Old Testament, if you read it, you're reading through the Bible, you find over and over again something God does that seems very uh, confusing to our cultural setting. Where God wants to talk to people about where they've failed him. And where they have drifted. And he calls them back. Through the judges, through the prophets, he calls them back. And over and over again, God will call the people to re re respond to his reproof. With sackcloth and ashes, right? I was a kid, I used to wonder, what on earth is this? sackcloth and ashes stuff. Where the people would deliberately strip down of anything fine, you know, the watch, the, and, and, and minimal uh, drab, rag-like. And faces marked with, why, why? Well, because we're, we're physical beings, physical bodies, and these bodies, we sin with these bodies. And our thoughts and our words and our deeds. And to make it vivid to people that you, you can't just trip the light fantastic with God and, and just move on to bigger and better things. And Imagine, imagine... Imagine thousands and thousands and thousands of people stopping everything they do. And there's no tambourines and no music. And it's sackcloth and ashes. And God wants everyone to realize there's nothing that's going to be set in order until, until each person comes to realize there's a... There's a bleakness, sackcloth and ashes, to sinful pursuits. And that needs to be really exposed and really renounced before anything good is going to follow. 
So don't just go about squishing the grapes to make wine. Repent with sackcloth and ashes. Now, he didn't want them to live in sackcloth and ashes. But to recognize the place for it. Nothing good will happen in my life or yours until we heed the Spirit's reproof. What's he talking to you about? Let's pray. 